morning, church. Come on in, find a seat if you haven't already. My name is Justin. I have the privilege of serving as a pastor here at City Light Bennington, where we exist to multiply Jesus-centered, spirit-led disciples and churches. Uh, friends, if you're new here this morning, we say welcome. We're so glad you're here. We would love to connect with you. At the end of the gathering, we invite you to go back to that Get Connected table. We'll have people there back to greet you, answer any questions you might have about the church here at City Light Bennington. Well, friends, I want to actually take a moment to invite my friend John Foster up to stage. Many of you know John. He and his wife, Teresa, are faithful servants in the church here at City Light Bennington. Uh, John has a powerful testimony that he wants to share just to testify to God's grace, something that he experienced recently. So, John, you have the floor. I got a testimony. I don't know how powerful it's going to be, but um, I'm glad that this is only partially filled here. You know. um, my name's John, like Justin said, and I just want to uh, testify, give a testimonial about Jesus. <laughs> about Jesus changing my life. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, I attended a conference up at uh, Christ Community Church. And it was a title of a soul care conference. It was, <coughs> it was done by Dr. Rob Reimer. And I stole some of his words to describe what it is. It's a, it's a course which helps people clean up their soul to develop a help, healthy inner life. They bring sins and secrets into the light with God and others. They break family sin patterns and bring God's presence to bear on some painful past experiences. They wrestle with the lies they believe and they learn how to renew their, their mind. And some of the stuff you talked about was, uh, I'm glad I got a, a mic stand here. <laughs> so I move around. But uh, they talk a lot about soul sledge, the, his term. And um, if, my, if my head ever drops and I start reading off of this in a monotone, that's a cry for help. You know, so just rescue me, okay? <laughs> and um, they talk about soul sledge, just the corruption and pollution you pick up. And uh, another term is just self awareness. Uh, asking yourself difficult questions, learning why I do what I do. And it helped me to see some of the family sin patterns I had in my life that I grew up with. Um, I'm 70, I got saved back in 1971. Sounds like 50 years of being with Jesus. But he's doing something new for me. And um, the soul sledge sludge and stuff that you pick up, just the corruption and pollution. And it was all working against me. You know, when, when you're young, a young teen, a young adult, and you grow up and you, you feel like you're invincible, nothing's going to hurt you or anything that does happen. You can just, it'll just slide off and it's not going to stay with you. And it's not until I got older and realized that sin always has its consequences. And even I got saved and kept all of this stuff that was occupying my soul, all of this pattern that I had in my life, I just kept it with me and did what I thought was the Christian norm, you know, going to church, reading my Bible, praying, having a devotion. I was good to my wife and kids. But if things got bad for me or I got mad or I got hurt or something, I would retreat to what I knew, not comfort food, but like comfort sin. And I didn't realize I was just strengthening this hold in my soul and in these patterns I had. And, uh, sorry, something you won't see up here, but reading glasses. <laughs> but uh, I was get victory but I wasn't feeling victorious all the time. Sometimes you feel like you're on a hamster wheel or a treadmill and everybody else is running the good race, you know, and you say, I'll, I'll catch up with you, you know. But going through this, uh, 
and just help me to change my view from this world culture view that I find myself in to reality that's in the kingdom view to learn that my identity identity is not what I was or what I am or what I will be in the future but my identity is anchored in in Jesus and that I need to adopt a, a more eternal identity and I, I just want to there's some counselors at the at the conference and they have to fight the spiritual warfare that's going on and uh, they helped me through this spiritual warfare. They, I got delivered from a lot of stuff. I got freed up from a lot of stuff. And I, I know this may sound weird to some people, but <laughs> with some of the sin I was in, and if you have any form of addiction at all, sometimes you find out that your your thoughts aren't all yours. You don't have control over them. And what I always had, as I just described, is just this noise in my head. Just thoughts kind of streaming through in the background, you know, that at any time that could just pull me down. And <laughs> after this, I got no noise in my head. It's clear, you know. But uh, now it's not to say... <laughs> I don't have any problems or I don't have bad thoughts, but now I can chase them out, you know, and realize that Jesus doesn't want this for, for me. I'm sorry, I get emotional, but I just want to read a couple of verses that the spirit of God really kind of laid on my heart. It's in Romans 5, 2, verse 5. It says, because of our faith, Christ has brought brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's love, God's glory, I'm sorry. And this hope will not lead to disappointment when we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And I know I'm not unusual, I'm pretty much an average guy. When I grew up, I never once heard my dad say, I love you, John. But now, as I read these verses, I know that my adopted father now with the Holy Spirit says that to me each day. <laughs> and that's and this change, that's what I want now. I want to be more and more intimate with God. I want to get as close as I can to be able to discern his voice, to be able to walk in the baptism of the Spirit, to be able to walk in the fullness of the Spirit and with the power that, that he has for us. And uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Amen. Can we give it up for John? Come on. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you. We give it up for Jesus and the Holy Spirit continuing to move. Amen. This is a church. This is the Father's house. And in the Father's house, there's freedom. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is here. We see him moving, continuing to heal. We know that that healing happens when we are rooted in our identity in Christ. And identity starts with intimacy. And that's why we'll always be pushing intimacy with Jesus and having our identity rooted in him. And that is where the healing happens. There's redemption. And we're just seeing a testimony from John with that. So give God praise there. Faithful servants in our church out of the overflow of that. And uh, speaking of faithful servants, we want to highlight continuing on. There's people in the church. One specifically this morning we want to highlight is Trish uh, Blaschko. Uh, if you know Trish, she is a, another faithful servant with our kids' ministry. We asked Trish why she wants to serve with kids, and this is what she said. She said, as a new church, serving has been one of the best ways to get to know other people in the church. As the body of Christ, we are called to be active participants in the lives of others, and serving at church is a small way to do that. 
since I have kids that receive the precious care from other believers on a weekly basis, I felt like I needed to chip in because I was receiving the benefit of it. Uh, Trish, this is the mentality. This is a kingdom culture mindset, and we just want to say thank you. We appreciate you. She might even be serving back there to this morning. She might not even be in here, um, but we want to say thank you for all those who do serve. Um, it matters. We are pouring into our kiddos and serving the bride of Christ in doing so. Uh, lastly, church, we just want to say thank you for all those who are generously giving to City Light Bennington. If you would consider City Light Bennington your home church, three ways now to give. Silver giving box in the back, online at citylightbennington.church. New way to give, you can text uh, um, 84321. Any text amount that you will give, you will be sent a link back in that message um, to finish setting up. So that's the third and newest way to give if you consider City Light Bennington your home church. Uh, friends, you go ahead and stand with me. I just want to create a space to focus our eyes on Jesus this morning. Um, we remember that this is the house of the Lord. This place belongs to Jesus. This is the Father's house. And as we're seeing testimony of the Spirit continuing to work in the house of the Lord, we're just giving God praise that he draws near to those who draw near to him. So I'm inviting us this morning, friends. Uh, something very simple yet profound is that we can have as much of God as we want. We can have as much of God as we want, friends. You can draw near to God and says he will draw near to you. So friends, would you draw near to the presence of God, the spirit of God that continues to heal and redeem in this area? In Jesus' name, let's sing. Let's worship this morning, amen? Come on, there's joy in this house, let's feel it. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, who evermore will be. Let's sing. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, yeah. my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. Shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling songs away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. Yeah. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, lift it up. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, sing it up. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Come on. We shout out Your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is 
surely in this place and we will be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today and we will be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Come on, lift up a shout of praise. In the darkness we will wait without hope, without light, till from heaven you came run. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. No. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died.
Take a moment with your Heavenly Father. Express in your heart or out loud a song of praise for His goodness in your life. The giver of all good things. He gives and He takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
Lord, I thank you that you never leave. I thank you that you never walk out on us, Jesus. You're so good. Come on, sing. Oh, God, you're so this morning. I'm going to invite Roy up. Would you please remain standing as he uh, reads from God's word, our scripture this morning. Morning, church. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to be reading from the passage of scripture that I will be preaching from. After I read, I'm going to pray, pray along with me. And then after that, I'm going to herald its truth for us to come underneath and submit to Everyone on the same page? Cool. Quick coaching. As I read, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You have freedom to and freedom not to. So as I read through the passage, and as I'm reading, something stirs in your heart as you see it on the screen. You have freedom to vocalize in amen. That is in agreement with the truths that are being explained. If the spirit's stirring in you, and you're like, ooh, I just can't keep this in, that's the spirit's way of saying vocalize in amen. Then you also have freedom to just focus on the screen and pray to yourself as it's going on. You're just thanking God for its truth. And then lastly, you have freedom to do nothing that I just said. <laughs> freedom not to. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Are we all on the same page, CLB? Yeah. Sounds good. So before we get into the passage, quick context. We have Jesus who's walking along with his disciples. And he's going to teach them the importance of prayer. Jesus, starting off here, in a little while, you won't see me anymore. But a little while after that, you'll see me again. Some of the disciples ask each other, what does he mean when he says, in a little while, you won't see me again? But then you'll see me again. What's he saying? Is he talking about how we're going to go to the Father? And what does this mean by a little while? We don't understand. Jesus realized they wanted to ask him about it. So he said, thank you, God, that you see us and how often we don't go to you first. And yet still you desire to give us an answer. You're a God who cares for the details of our lives. Jesus speaking, are you seeking yourselves that I, what I mean? I said in a little while... You won't see me, but a little while after, you'll see me again. I tell you the truth. Jesus, thank you that you are the truth with a capital T. That despite what we hear in culture or in the political landscape or subjective truths with people saying my truth, your truth, that you are the truth with a capital T. 
that we can go to you. You epitomize truth. There is no subjective truth in your word. You say the way to the Father is through you. God, your word is our objective truth. What you have said is what we come underneath and submit to. Objective truth. Let's pick it back up. You will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, Jesus says. But this world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful, say it with me, joy. Thank you, God, that you're the God of turning. You're the God who anyone who has been born again by his spirit can testify that God has given us a godly sorrow to repent, for us to repent, to turn away from the way that we used to be and to follow you, God. And I thank you that you still give us your spirit and the intimacy with you that you cause us that when we do insignificant things, which we didn't think that were a sin in the past, that it unsettles us now and that you cause us to turn. You're the God of turning, and you're the God who produces wonderful joy. Church, we don't serve a deity who's not looking out for our best interest. We have one who is admirable and wants to give us and turn us to wonderful, say it again, joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to, say it with me, joy, because she has brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again then you will rejoice, and no one, no one can rob you of that, say it with me, joy. Our God is a God who once he saves and ransoms you and you experience joy, he will protect you. Anyone need protection of your joy this morning? You know the God of the universe who says that you will never be taken from his hand. All the enemy, enemy's voice you're hearing that's stealing your joy is not from your good father born again saying, you well, he will never be robbed of the joy that's had in you. Verse 23, at that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I'll tell you the, here it goes again, capital T, truth. And you will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. Whose name is that? You haven't done this before. Ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundance. Say it with me, church. Joy. Father, we come to you. We thank you for your word. It does not have to be boring. You are not a boring God. God, we thank you that you illuminate the scriptures that jump off our page. We thank you for your sense of humor. We thank you for your joy that's represented in the house of the Lord. Holy Spirit, have your way in the church. Do your thing. May you, have, you end up speaking not just to me but through me. And in the congregation, as you end up speaking to them, God, would they end up going to you and saying, is that from you, God? And then would they deliver the word to build someone else up? God, build your church in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's get straight into it. Go ahead and have a seat. Today's scene in which we just ended up going through, it takes place during what theologians call a farewell discourse. So we have less than 12 hours left in Jesus' life. And Jesus, the past four chapters, have been walking along his disciples. And he's been preparing them for the last four chapters for his departure. And now he's going to teach them on the importance of prayer because they won't see him again. What is prayer? If you are a born-again child of God, it's simply this. It's you outstretched arms asking for your daddy's help. It's asking for God the Father's help and why that is important and why we need to pay attention to this text is because Mark 1.35 the importance and the connectivity of prayer, the, the pattern of your praying life has everything to do with the effective ministry you'll have. Now, Mark 1.35 is an example of Jesus. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark outside, Jesus got up, he left the house, and went off to pray. And during that time, while he's praying, he's hearing from the Father, right? The first thing he does is go, boom, he's praying. Then he has one of his disciples come up to him, tap his shoulder, figurative royal interpretation here, and he's like, hey, you got ministry to do. Jesus ends up saying, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go herald the truth to the next city. He ends up going. The next thing he does after he's prayed up is he ends up healing a lame person. So, friends, I know that not every one of us are going to experience moments that seem more miraculous but more mundane, but yet it's still ministry. What is ministry? It's God's spirit working through you to build someone up. You with me? 
So it may not be that you're walking around laying hands on people and they're being healed. If that's God's will for you and if that's your intimacy level, praise God. But for most of us, it's the mundane. A lot of us are in ministry roles where we are mothers trying to keep our nose above water and instruct our kids who are totally in original sin and rebellious. For some of us, it's as husbands to be sacrificial as the leader of the household. Okay, are you starting to see the ministry and what God's called you to and the mantles you possess? That, my friends, is an example. Why you need to know and what the importance of prayer is, it will fuel your effectiveness in ministry. It will fuel how much you enjoy your occupancy, or sorry, how, your, your uh, job, not occupancy, job. Okay, so as we jump into the text, we just have to have parameters of why this matters, because as we work through it, you'll end up seeing that Jesus ends up elevating through the conversation with his disciples, then how to deepen our prayer. Okay, Mark, or sorry, John 16, verse 16. In a little while, you won't see me anymore, but a little while after that, you will see me again. Jesus is alluding to his disciples of his imminent death. It's coming in a couple hours. And he's saying basically, you won't see me after this, but you'll see me again after the resurrection. And here's the respond. The the, the disciples respond with confusion. Look with me in verse 17. We read it earlier. Some of the disciples asked each other, what does he mean when he says, in a little while you won't see me, but then you'll see me? And am I going to the Father? And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. They were straight up just confused by what Jesus meant. And instead of asking for clarification, because they were confused by Jesus' words, they have the man literally right there. They end up just talking amongst themselves. And Jesus is standing there like, uh, I'm right here. Do you want to talk with me? Do you want to ask me a question? I can not only hear you, but by the way, he's God in the flesh. He can interpret their thoughts. Check it out. Verse 19, Jesus realized, and he ends up saying to the disciples, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said in a little while, you won't see me, but a little while after that, you'll see me again. You can hear his irritability in his voice. He's like, for real, are you guys really going to talk amongst yourselves when I'm right here? And the irritability is not because he thinks so highly of himself, though he is God. It's that they're not coming to him first. They're not coming to him first. They're going to one another. And if this doesn't sound familiar in your life, it sounds familiar in my life. If the disciples, catch this, were neglecting going to Jesus while he was physically in front of them, how much more is the church when we don't see Jesus that we neglect going to him first? That we neglect going to him first. Um, Last month, the Spirit of God kept bringing up thoughts. That's how he talks to me. And the pattern of thinking is like, okay, that's not normal, or if it is normal, it's so selfless. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of scary. So what happened was, he's like, okay, wake up early, get a prayer huddle uh, started, and start interceding on the behalf of this church and the relationships in here, and then start praying for the area. And so, in other words, it was tuned in like, you're a part of starting CLB to become a house of prayer. Do something about it. So I end up um, being like, all right, I'm going all in. I start praying. I start planning. It's the, I start inviting friends into this. And then it's the night before, and I'm unsure. Like, if you've ever took some ownership on some things, and you're like, You got, I mean, you got like, if someone was to look at like the sheet I had and be like, ooh, not good. I'm like, for real? We're about to scrap right now. Like that's how much ownership I had in that. I was invested in it. And I got to a point of confusion. I'm like, am I supposed to pray for this or pray for this with the group? So boom, my initial reaction is call my mentor. I call my mentor and he ends up sending this text back. Ask the Lord. (laughs) Scotty, what should I do? Ask the Lord. Which in his way was saying, I don't know, have you asked God? Cut straight to the heart. Motivations filleted open. I realized that I was guilty like the disciples of going to peers and people rather than going to God first. Church, where do we go first with questions, with concerns, with issues in our marriage, with control issues, with relationships. It's obvious that we shouldn't go towards overtly sinful things, right? You tracking with me, church? But how many of us go to good things rather than God's best? 
And here's what I mean, that when stuff comes up, you go to podcasts, you go to books, you go to Christian resources, you go to conferences. I mean, you're hitting it all up. And those are good things. Those are good gifts from God. But they pale in comparison to going to God first. There's an order of seeking God that will produce two types of born-again sons and daughters of his. The first one is intimates. The second one is non-intimates, but yet still all are sons and daughters of God because of his work and their faith. You tracking with me? Now, the person who continually has a pattern of going to peers and books and awesome authors who we would all end up recommending, that pattern of going to that first instead of God will produce a shallow intimacy in comparison to going to God first. Some of us are like, uh, uh, trust me, I've been in that. If I was sitting in your seat a couple years ago, I'd be like, what is this dude talking about? There's something about waiting on the Lord that sharpens you, puts spine, steel in your spine. That gives you perseverance that makes you say, how much do I want this? How much am I willing to wait on the Lord? You know, going to peers or resources first versus going to God first is the difference in intimacy between, um, in, a, in a marriage relationship, talking with your spouse and then reading an autobiography on your spouse. They produce totally different intimacy, intimacy levels. But guess what? Praise God for the books and resources because they do get you acquainted with God. Okay? I'm nuancing this so that everyone understands it's not an either or, but it's order. Where are we going as a church first? I suggest that if anyone in this congregation or those who are visiting has an issue with hearing the Spirit's voice, the voice of God in your thought life or through visions or through dreams, and nobody's trying to say to you and try to distinguish, I suggest it's not because God's not talking to you, friend. I suggest it's because you're so used, just as I was, to hearing from God through others. To hearing from God through others. I, just as some of you, get so used to what, what, we'll just coin it now, the recycled voice of God. That all we're doing is just diminishing when God needs to talk to us directly, how we can recognize his voice. It produces it within us. Was that me? Was that the food I ate? Or was that God? We're so used to the recycled voice of God that's an echo to you. Making appeal to you. Come to Christ. Pray up. It's a lifeblood. It's like breathing. And yet still some of us in this congregation will not follow suit because it's an echo, echo of God's voice. What we need in this church is to hear directly from God first. Someone give an amen. Let's continue on into the text and see what else we can learn from being prayed up. Jesus is going to make a promise to his disciples that he will answer everything that they pray in his name. Verse 23, and at that time, you won't need to ask me anything. Jesus is not saying, he's saying, he's not saying you won't have to talk to me after I'm resurrected, after I die. He's more so saying, you won't have all these questions that you've had in the beginning of the conversation anymore because everything will be revealed to you and the Holy Spirit will end up being poured out. Verse 23, let's continue to press on. I tell you the truth, Jesus is speaking. You will ask the Father directly and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Check out the promise here. By the way, can anyone give a hand up to God in thanksgiving that he's not only the promise giver but the promise keeper? Come on. Someone's got to testify and with that being said, this is a hard passage to work through and say, I don't see this all the time. When I pray in Jesus' name, my prayers don't always get answered. See, the promise that Jesus is making to his disciples is that he's going to answer everything in his name. What we need to do is ask the two questions that are very obvious and plain on our minds. The first one is, if I ask for literally anything in Jesus' name, will he give a yes? The emphatic answer is no. Yeah, some of y'all were like, ooh, I don't even know. Don't worry. It's a no. 
It's a no. The answer is a no. The logical conclusion then has to end up being, well, God's a liar if it's a no. But check it out with me. Use this as a tool to interpret scripture. Awesome principle. Interpret scripture with scripture. Interpret scripture with other portions of scripture. Jesus is answering your prayer or others' prayers because of his name on conditions and conditional promises. So what he's making right here is a conditional promise. It's basically, uh, he's holding his hand out like a covenant between you and him, and he's saying, there is a yes for your prayer, but there are some conditions that need to be met on your side. So with interpreting scripture by scripture, you'll end up seeing here, these are some hindrances to prayer for you note takers. These are some hindrances to prayer. If there's unconfessed sin in your heart, impure motives, uh, disconnected to Jesus, uh, husbands mistreating their brides, asking for things that don't please the Lord. So leave this up for them, just. And for you note takers, which there are like one people here, feel free. You can also go back and, you know, sift through this. We're going to work through the passage a little bit more because then there's a condition in which we have to trust God that he knows best. It may not be that there are conditions that we're not meeting. We may be clean as a whistle, but yet God still gives a no. Check it, check it out here. Ask using my name, repeat, and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. The result of Jesus answering our prayers, praise God, anyone can testify is abundant joy. But think about it and re-engineer this with me. In other words, God will only say yes to the prayers that inevitably result in abundant joy. God the Father will only say yes to prayers that will inevitably result in abundant joy. So we have to ask ourselves, where's our greatest joy right now? Is it in respect from others? It is in our personal interest? Is it, is it in making our kids do what we desire and having great kids and having everything ship within the household? Is it more money, more sin? Is it more stuff? If those are genuinely where your alliance is leaning, don't expect, and where your prayers go, don't expect a yes from God, even if you use his name. Even if you use his name. But for most of us, for most of us, we may not get a yes from God because he's directing us towards a greater joy. How many of us in this congregation could look back and say, I wanted something so bad and praise God, I didn't get it. Because there was abundant, one brother in the house, there was abundant, two brothers in the house. We've got a three, I'm, I'm like up here trying to auction right now. <laughs> abundant joy is what we're trusting God for. Praise God, he's closed doors. There are some people next to you that you may be married to and you may not think the same thing, do not raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. That's just a caution. An example that we had a couple weeks ago was Carrie. Carrie came up here and she ended up testifying of God's goodness through the cancer that she's still enduring. She's prayed prayers of ultimate healing. She has not heard a yes from Jesus yet. And then she finished up her testimony by saying, and I would still go, go through cancer all over again because it produced in me, meaning Carrie, a joy and intimacy in Christ. Theologian Sam Storm says, God will not give us anything in prayer that will diminish our joy in Jesus. We may think to ourselves that if God would only give us whatever we ask, that our joy would increase. Gosh, by the way, is that not a picture of when, when your little children are growing up, they want everything. And yet, as a parent, you're like, no, that's not good for you. And as you mature and grow in Christ, Lord willing, as you continue to seek him and grow in your stature, just like a little child would, you'll start to discern, okay, God, that wasn't God's best for me. But he knows better than we do. He knows that some things, though good enough in and of themselves, will only serve to distract us from focus on Jesus and undermine our capacity to enjoy him to the fullest. Second question that has to pop up in your head what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? It's important to understand that we don't even have to repeat the words in Jesus' name to pray in Jesus' name. 
there is, it, it, just in articulating in Jesus' name, just the words in Jesus' name, does not mean that you end up getting the prayer like mail sent up into the mail room of God's throne. There, there's no power to demolish demonic strongholds in our area or over your household or over your life or depression just by saying his name. Some of y'all are like, okay, you better, you better nuance this, pastor. So praying in Christ's name is less, catch this, about form and more about attitude. Less about form, more about attitude. And that attitude is something along the lines of, God, all that I have and not all that I will have is because of you. God, I am praying according to your word because I don't want to defy your revealed word. God, everything that I will do and can do is because of your hand on my life. This attitude that a person has praying in Christ's name is like, it's like as you approach Christ's throne, you're saying, I have your attention, God. I have your ear because of your merits in Christ, not my own. It's this attitude that we won't ask for anything unless it's his best. What we don't want to do in CLB is to treat Jesus' name as a genie lamp as we pray or as a lucky rabbit's foot. We don't want to think that we can mechanically garner all of heaven's blessings because we say at the end, in Jesus' name. But with that being said, say Jesus' name as you pray as many times as the Holy Spirit leads you. Because if you mean it, you can say it. And in the authority, there's nothing like praying, praying, praying. And when you're thanking God for something, you end up saying in Jesus' name. And you start to remember that everything that I have, the blessings that I'm thanking God for, is because of his sacrifice. There's nothing like adoring God and saying, God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace, undeserved favor. Thank you for your kindness. And when you say Jesus' name, all it does is bring into account it's because of his sacrifice on Calvary. There's nothing like praying for others and yourself. And when you end up praying for others or yourself, you say in Jesus' name, and it, it comes back to memory. I have been given as a promise all authority on heaven and on earth to see captives set free, that I would testify of God's goodness and by his blood that they would come to saving faith, that when you pray, unseen things happen, that when we pray against demonic strongholds because Christ is the head of all dominion powers, that we have his attention, that when we say and we pray for our children, what, count, what comes to recount as we say in Jesus' name is to remind ourselves that we ain't in control of our kids' salvation. It's only by God's gifting. So when we end up saying, don't say Jesus' name, if you mean it, say it. Say what you mean and mean what you say because there's power when you mean it. Amen? Amen. Last one. Whatever you do, church, don't stop asking. Verse 24, ask using my name, Jesus is speaking, and you will receive joy, and you will have abundant joy. The original word for ask is a present imperative future verb. In other words, it's ask, 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 continue to ask, and when you're done asking, ask. So don't just ask for now, ask in the future, and, can you, and continue to ask when you are weary of asking. That's the type of asking, and not everyone grew up in a, in a household where you were allowed to ask a bunch of questions, all right, like, okay, so some of us grew up in a household where it was just like, do it because I said so, you know, which is perfectly fine for a certain age, but inevitably, you just want answers. Good fathers get worn out by how persistent their children ask for even good things, but God the Father is not only good, but he's perfect. When, when you ask, he knows that you're coming to him. And he wants to hear from his children, amen? So don't feel like you're wearing God out. Continue to ask. I think that the asking that has to do with here is praying for others, praying for others. And it's the type of praying that costs you something. It's the, the type of praying that costs you time, 
It may cost you friends because you don't got time for them. It may cost you sleep. It may cost you energy. And it's just this attitude that you have like Jacob used to have. I will not depart from your presence, God. I will not stop asking unless you bless me. It is a persistent prayer. It's the type of prayers that you just, you get woke up in the middle of the night and you're like, someone's on my mind and I'm not going to stop praying until you tell me, Holy Spirit. It's that type of asking. It's that type of asking, church, that right now is being talked about from Jesus. It's the type of asking that starts and sustains revivals. It's that type of asking in which this, this church came about, to be honest. It's persistent asking and asking and asking of the Father. It's that type of asking. Ian Bounds, an American Christian author, ends up saying it this way. He lived in the 1800s. Every mighty move of the Spirit of God has had its source in the prayer chamber. Every mighty move of the Spirit of God has had its source in the prayer chamber. You got a prayer chamber? You even know what a prayer chamber is? It's physical, sure, but you, you got the temple of God walking around. What kind of chamber you got? How dependent on God's spirit are you? Are we so arrogant that we make decisions without considering God first and we go to one another? Are we going to be a church that ends up going to one another, hissy-fitting about so-and-so? Are we going to go to God first? Are we going to go to God first in every situation? Friends, envision with me, if, if God's, if this is true with Ian Bounds' quote, if God's spirit is in the prayer chamber, if it's in the persistent, long praying, how worn out do our knees have to be? How much lotion do we ought to use through the winter? If you got carpet, where in your house are there two spots when you're on your knee? That's the type of praying that God answers, okay? Not all the time, but when he sees fit, that's the type of perseverant, persistent asking that is hungry within. That's like, God, bless it, and I'm going to continue in my praying. Church, what we need most is not more and better city groups. It's not more and better sermons. It's not more and better teacher preachers. It's not even a better building, y'all. And I said more. That's still awesome. (laughs) What we need most are better men and women. Men and women of prayer. Check it out. Ian Bounds, do your thing again. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men and women of prayer, men and women mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men and women. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men and women of prayer. God, build your church. Give us a hunger that's insatiable where we would want to hear from you and we wouldn't rest until we hear from you. God, help us be okay with the weights as your, as your answer, the no's and the yeses. In Jesus' name. Friends, attention up here. We're going to end up having a family meal this morning. We are going to have communion and we do this in remembrance of what God has done for us. So once I'm done praying, you're gonna, everyone's going to come up, and there's going to be elements here. There's going to be grape juice representing the blood of Christ that was spilled. And then there's going to be a cracker there to represent his body that was broken for us. Everything that was preached about, any hunger that you have to pray and connect with God. Because guess what? It's like breathing for our spiritual life. It was all purchased on the cross for you. And so we want to remember what he's done for us. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Hey, you're already here. There's no need to rush. When you come up here and you grab the elements, as the Spirit leads, no need to rush. 
Ask the Spirit how to recount God's goodness in your life before taking the elements. What we don't want to do is not wait on the Lord, rush into things, but really grapple with the gravity of how kind Christ's sacrifice was for us. Jesus continues, this cup is the new covenant between God and people, an agreement confirmed with his blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat the bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. If you haven't yet let Jesus run your life, and, and that you're not born again, feel free to sit down. This is a family meal. Take into account some recognizable faces or just the sheer volume of people who are coming up here because they've experienced the kindness of Christ and surrendered to his will. And then consider the cost of what it would take for you to join in the procession that you'll end up seeing here. As I finish prayer, feel free to get up and come up. Sound good? Jesus, your kindness, your faithfulness is upon this church. Have your will and your way, Holy Spirit. May we be a people who would hunger and thirst for you and pray to you, not because of duty, but because of delight. In Jesus' name, amen. to join the song so long before I rise to raise our voice heaven and earth we sing your faithfulness See you. Speak glorify. 
see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Sing it out. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah. You take. You take what the enemy you turn it for good, you turn it for good, yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory for the battle. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Yeah, for the battle belongs to you. Do you love? Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for Church, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for Roy and just the heralding of your word to show us that, Jesus, you have torn the veil of complete access to the Father at any time. Father, we thank you that we have seen your heart, a heart of compassion, mercy, and grace through the scriptures this morning, through your preacher, your open vessel, and Roy. Spirit, we thank you for your ministry in the pulpit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My well, friends, I've been told that Charles Spurgeon in this quote he has says that uh, because God is a living God, he can hear. And because he is a loving God, he will hear. Um, I think we heard that this morning um, to intercede, to get on our knees and spend time with the Father. I want to bring up a couple now. Um, we're going to share a little bit about their city group. So we'd love to have you guys introduce yourself and, and just tell us kind of when and where. Good morning. Just a real quick announcement. Uh, I'm Steve Royer. This is my wife, Jerry. And uh, we're excited, folks. Uh, next Sunday night, we're going to be launching a new city group right here in Anchor Point. So it's for, uh, it's for empty nesters. Uh, the group is called Empty Zesters. Uh, they're uh, nesters that have a zest for Christ. So we'd love to have you be a part of that. Uh, it's for singles. It's for couples, uh, any ages. But no kiddos. So if uh, the kids are gone or almost gone, or if you want them to be gone, <laughs> we'd love to have you on a Sunday night. Jesus loves and he saves and he redeems. 
we want to gather together and do life with people who want to rejoice in that and experience it fully and joyfully and even painfully when needed. Um, he just transforms us, changes us when we seek him in his word. So come on, join us. So let's do life together. Uh, it's Sundays, 6 o'clock. Again, it's in Anchor Point, which is four blocks away. If you'd like more information, we'll be in the back of the room. We'll give you a little uh, handout. But next, uh, next week, we're having an Italian potluck. So <laughs> come on. This is it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yes, please get connected back at the Get Connect table after the gathering this morning. Uh, we have a full list of all of our city groups. Uh, that is one of the main rhythms that we have. We gather here on Sunday and scatter throughout the week. Church, you are blessed. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy communing with the Father in prayer this week.